Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our, our uh, presenter and respondent for our second panel. We have uh, with us Professor Dennis Patterson from Rutgers University School of Law. Uh, you can look in your uh, programs to read all about him, but uh, we're welcoming, welcoming him back. He was a visiting fellow in the James Madison program a few years ago, and it's always nice uh, to have Dennis back, back at Princeton. Uh, he will be uh, talking about the service conception of authority, conceptual analysis, law, and practices of value. Uh, after uh, Professor Patterson uh, has concluded his initial remarks, uh, then uh, Michael Stephen Green, a professor of law at College of William and Mary, will respond. Uh, Dennis will be offered an opportunity to make further remarks, and then we'll open it up to you. So, uh, Dennis. Brad, thank you. Um, before I read the paper I have prepared for you today, I want to just tell you a brief story. Um, is it, oh, yeah, I had to pull it up closer. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. How's this? Is that better? Okay, great. Um, I finished law in graduate school in 1980, and uh, after doing the uh, obligatory clerkship, uh, I started to practice law, and uh, contrary to my expectations, I rather liked it. Um, in fact, uh, many days I would return from a day uh, in court, uh, ultimately, getting to uh, try cases and saying, I just can't believe people actually pay me to do this. It's so much fun. Um, but as it happened, I never quite uh, could get the um, academic culture out of my system. And I went to a week-long conference on legal philosophy at the uh, University of Western Ontario, where Joseph was uh, one of the four philosophers giving lectures. And, um, I found that week to be uh, so compelling and my uh, interaction with Joseph uh, to be so moving that I decided then and there I was going to leave the practice of law and go into academia. Not only was Joseph encouraging, he did the thing that uh, very few people do but for which I am eternally grateful and that is he helped me get my first job. So I'm going to show my appreciation now by uh, doing the, um, the ultimate um, uh, show of affection and appreciation. I'm going to disagree with him. The Morality of Freedom is one of, if not the most important books combining legal and political theory since the publication of H.L.A. Hart's seminal work, The Concept of Law. Separated by 25 years, these two works articulate the fullest and subtlest accounts of law in the positivist tradition. Both books were written against the background of substantial intellectual ferment in analytic philosophy. When Hart wrote Concept, Wittgenstein and Austin reigned supreme in Oxbridge. By the time the morality of freedom appeared, Rawls had revived political philosophy and Quinean naturalism was firmly ensconced, at least in America, as the preferred methodology for metaphysics and epistemology. I begin with this brief look at history because I want to locate my comments on the morality of freedom in current disputes and controversies in analytic jurisprudence. My focus will be Raz's unique and much discussed account of authority. While controversial, Raz's account of authority has been widely influential and rightly so. It is precise, powerful, and a great advance over previous efforts. Raz's account of authority implicates three distinct yet related subjects. First, his account of authority is an investigation into one aspect of practical reasoning. Second, Owing to the nature of authority, Raz's claims for authority implicate fundamental issues in legal theory, most directly the issue of the nature of law. Finally, and related to the question of the nature of law, Raz's account of authority raises methodological questions. In my remarks, I will focus on two issues raised by Raz's account of authority and claims for his view of the nature of law exclusive legal positivism. First, I want to consider the degree to which a critical element of exclusive legal positivism, the sources thesis, confronts the need for interpretation in law. 
The point I wish to make is that debate about the role of evaluative criteria in the context of interpretation puts pressure on the sources thesis in ways that undermine claims on behalf of exclusive legal positivism. Second, I want to locate Raz's account of authority and the claims he makes for it in the context of the most recent general debate in analytic jurisprudence, the methodology debate. It is in the light of this debate that I want to pursue certain questions about Raz's account of authority and the claims he and others make on its behalf as a fundamental aspect of his theory of law. Raz's theory of authority has always been provocative and interesting. As I hope to show, the theory is as important in contemporary debates on the nature of law as it was two decades ago. The service conception of authority. Authority, on Raz's view, mediates between persons and reasons. It concerns the question of when and under what circumstances one should submit to the directives of another. It is worth emphasizing, moreover, that an authority need not be a person. The law, for example, may be an authority. Raz wants to know when we can say that the law possesses authority. Before proceeding further, let me briefly summarize the main features of Raz's account of authority. Following Raz, I shall refer to each of these elements as theses. First, the dependence thesis. To be authoritative, a directive must be based on reasons which apply to the subject or subjects of the directive. These reasons are dependent reasons. Second, the normal justification thesis. In the usual circumstance, one is acknowledged to have authority over another if the subject is likely better to comply with reasons which apply to him or her, that is, if he or she accepts the directives of the authority as authoritatively binding and makes a good faith effort to follow them, than if he or she tries to follow the dependent reasons which apply directly. Third and finally, the preemption thesis. The fact that an authority requires an action, that is, issues a directive, is a reason for its performance which reason is not to be added to all other relevant reasons when the addressee is deciding what to do but should replace at least some of them. Raz on the authority of law. Raz's account of authority is an essential feature of his view of the nature of law. He maintains that the law necessarily claims to be a genuine and not merely a de facto authority. And for law to fulfill the mediating role that it claims for itself on Raz's view, it must issue dictates that can be readily understood and acted upon. More specifically, people need to be able to grasp legal norms independently of their identifying and considering the dependent reasons for those norms. It is for this reason that Raz advocates exclusive legal positivism. Exclusive legal positivism rests on the view that the content of law must come from social sources alone. Raz articulates the sources thesis as follows. Quote, all law is source-based. A law is source-based if its existence and content can be identified by reference to social facts alone without resort to any evaluative argument. Close quote. On this last point, the role of evaluative argument in law, Raz stands a great distance from Tworkin. For Tworkin, law is evaluative all the way down. But one need not look to an anti-positivist like Tworkin for disagreement with Raz on this point. Inclusive or so-called soft positivists like Jules Coleman reject Raz's claim regarding the essential features of law. For Coleman, it is simply a contingent social fact whether the law of a given jurisdiction includes moral norms in its law. While there is much in the exclusive legal positivist picture of law to which I am attracted, I think Raz underplays the extent to which evaluation is a central feature of law and legal practice, at least more central than the exclusive legal positivist account of law might suggest. I think Raz is right about the role of dependent reasons in law. Law is not a practice where the grounds of law are endlessly debated. Law is successful and authoritative, at least in part, because anyone from the most sophisticated lawyer to the average citizen reading a case summary in the daily newspaper can discern why a case is decided as it is and why it still makes sense to say 
the judge got the law right and means something more than the judge reached my preferred outcome or indeed the judge reached the morally correct outcome. Of course, identifying just what it means to say that a judge got the law right or wrong is the business of legal theory. Let us begin with the question, how is the content of law identified? This is a question about legal methodology or legal reasoning. How is it that lawyers answer the question whether the law permits, prohibits, or requires a certain action? Consider an example. The Supreme Court of the United States takes up the question whether it is constitutionally permissible for a state to execute a minor for a capital crime. How is the law identified so that the directive is sufficiently well identified to answer the question posed? Locating the U.S. Constitution is easily accomplished, but once we locate it, what are we to do with it? How do we go about answering the question whether the state's proposed action is constitutionally permissible? And can that question be answered without resort to the dependent reasons the Constitution was meant to displace? No one would dispute that any answer to the question must begin with the text of the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, specifically the clause that prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. While relevant, the text of the Eighth Amendment is not dispositive. For example, we know that the framers and ratifiers of the Constitution themselves endorsed capital punishment. Did they intend the practice of execution to reach minors? Take the words cruel and unusual. These words have a then contemporary meaning, but that meaning is somewhat different today. For example, is the use of lethal injection now, permi now permitted? For that matter, is the form of execution of any moment in answering the question whether the proposed punishment is cruel and or unusual? Executions, even of a minor, have an alleged deterrent effect. Is there any data to prove this one way or the other? Do offending minors who are spared the ultimate punishment go on to commit other crimes? Should the diversity of state interests matter in the decision whether to prohibit the execution of a minor? Is the value of pluralism with respect to the different interests of states of sufficient importance to permit execution in some states while prohibiting the practice in others? Are there any precedents for disparate treatment of capital offenders such that we could endorse like treatment in this instance? Finally, would it be important to decide as a matter of principle that the taking of the life of a minor is inconsistent with the American ethos? Would it not simply be apostasy for the state to take a young life, even one that has been an instrument of extreme brutality? These are the questions one must ask to answer the question of the constitutionality of capital punishment for minors convicted of a capital crime. The questions I have posed are not unusual in the slightest. To the contrary, these questions track the familiar forms of constitutional argument, historical, textual, prudential, doctrinal, and ethical. These forms of argument constrain and shape the possibilities for answers to our query, but they do not by themselves point in a single direction. In fact, the problem is more severe. It may well be that the forms of argument conflict in that they point in different directions. For example, historical argument may look to the intent and understanding of the framers to draw the conclusion that taking the life of a minor is constitutionally permissible. But the contemporary understanding of cruel and unusual or our current ethical sensibilities may point in the opposite direction. When this occurs, interpretation of the Constitution is both warranted and necessary. I won't rehearse the full panoply of issues implicated by constitutional interpretation. I raise the issue because I want to ask how the Razian conception of authority and exclusive legal positivism handle questions of interpretation. Recall that a central feature of Raz's conception of authority is that a legitimate authority enjoys that status because it preempts consideration of the dependent values it purports to replace. In this regard, recall the test Raz sets for exclusive legal positivism, specifically the sources thesis. All law is source-based. A law is source-based if its existence and content can be identified by reference to social facts alone without resort to any evaluative argument. It seems to me that the exclusive legal positivist has two problems in the interpretive context just described, problems that are not limited to the interpretation of constitutions. 
First is the problem of choosing which from among the relevant forms of argument is to be the dominant or decisive form for purposes of taking a decision. Will the historical intentions of the framers and ratifiers be central, or will an argument from principle be fashioned that will prove decisive? But there's another problem or dimension to the interpretive context, and that is the problem of the criteria we use to decide among competing interpretations. The rule of recognition dictates that the forms of argument I identified are the way in which we appraise answers to the constitutional question posed. But the rule of recognition is less clear about the criteria for deciding among competing interpretations. And here, it seems, we find the problem of evaluative criteria raised anew. Raised anew. Even if we accept that all law is source-based, and we further accept that the forms of argument I have identified are the means for assessing the truth value of claims made from the constitutional point of view, we still must face the specter of substantive, evaluative disagreement on interpretive matters. Again, I have no problem with either the sources thesis or the idea that in our practice of law, the forms of argument are the proper tools for the assessment of constitutional claims. My claim is that in interpretive debates over which of several interpretations is deemed best, evaluative criteria, for example, consistency, comprehensiveness, minimal mutilation, the Quinean epistemic virtues, are necessarily implicated. And if this is so, what does this mean for Raz's account of authority and his claims on behalf of exclusive legal positivism? At least two responses are possible. First, following Timothy Endicott, the exclusive legal positivist can claim that while interpretation is a pervasive feature of law, in every case it is possible to have, as Endicott puts it, one true interpretation. The second response is to argue that interpretation is not a fundamental or pervasive feature of law that, as Andre Marmor puts it, quote, interpretation is the exceptional, not the standard mode of understanding language. Let me take the second point first. I am in complete agreement that interpretation is not the fundamental mode of argument in law. As I've argued elsewhere, this is a fatal error in Dworkin's account of the nature of law. But one need not show that interpretation is a fundamental aspect of legal practice to sustain the need for an account of interpretation and its role in a general theory of the nature of law. With respect to the first point, the need for an account of interpretation in law, at least two strategies are open to the exclusive legal positivist. First, he can claim, he can argue that in every case there is one true interpretation. The success of this strategy would depend upon an argument that is not yet in the arsenal of the exclusive legal positivist. Moreover, the argument would have to be made in such a way as not to undercut the central claim of exclusive legal positivism. That is, that law gains its claim to authority by precluding resort to dependent reasons. However the exclusive legal positivist develops his account of interpretation, that account would itself have to preclude resort to dependent reasons in just the same way the primary account of authority did, an altogether difficult task. I shall now turn to the second of my two points for today, the place of exclusive legal positivism in the current methodology debate in analytic jurisprudence. As we will see, the, this debate itself raises issues of fundamental concern for all legal theorists who, like Raz, argue for a conception of law that depends, at least in part, on appeal to necessity or universality with respect to the concept of law. Raz's account of authority, in particular his account of the nature of law's authority, is widely regarded as making conceptual claims about the nature of law. Until quite recently, the description of one's position using the word conceptual or metaphysical drew virtually no attention. This situation has recently changed. I want to first describe the current situation and then ask what it might mean for Raz's conception of authority and its role as a key element in exclusive legal positivism. Analytic general jurisprudence has become increasingly attentive to its own methodology. No longer content with its traditional first order questions revolving around the varieties, commitments, and defensibility of legal positivism, the discipline of jurisprudence has turned inward, asking the second order question, how should one do jurisprudence? This second order methodological question is not unrelated to jurisprudence's traditional first order concerns, to be sure, 
as the role of evaluation and indeed the role of moral theorizing more specifically figures prominently in the methodological inquiry much as it does in the first order debates among positivists, interpretivists, and natural law theorists about the role that morality plays or can play as criteria of legality. A brief history of the methodology debate. In the concept of law, Hart advanced a, po a powerful case for legal positivism, which he characterized as descriptive uh, jurisprudence. A central feature of Hart's project was a clarification of legal practice through a perspicuous description of its salient features. Ronald Dworkin, the most persistent critic of legal positivism, has consistently contested the possibility of the descriptive jurisprudence that Hart envisioned. One of Dworkin's central claims advanced uh, systematically in Law's Empire is that law is what Dworkin terms an interpretive concept. Law is an interpretive concept because to understand the concept, one needs to grasp its point or purpose. On Dworkin's view, one of the key dimensions of law is its coerciveness, and consequently, any explication of the concept of law must be able to explain and justify this important aspect of state action. For Dworkin, justifying state coercion is a, if not the, fundamental task of jurisprudence. More importantly, it is an enterprise that is inescapably normative and not pace heart, merely descriptive. The second edition of the concept of law, published posthumously in 1994, contained a rich and controversial postscript, wherein Hart maintained that he and Dworkin were engaged in different philosophical enterprises, and that both enterprises were legitimate methodologies for jurisprudence. In reply, Dworkin remained unpersuaded, maintaining that his was the only appropriate methodology for jurisprudence. Hart and positivists generally have argued that description of the law without justification of the law is possible. Dworkin, as well as John Finnis and Stephen Perry, have insisted that jurisprudence must necessarily engage in moral justification. Perry has argued that Hart's own jurisprudential methodology, though avowedly purely descriptive, in fact incorporated both descriptive and normative elements. It was descriptive insofar as Hart attempted simply to describe the concept of law, but it was unavoidably normative, his own self-understanding notwithstanding, insofar as Hart sought to describe it from the perspective of those over whom the law claims authority. Put roughly, in order to explain why those subject to legal authority should respect that legal authority, as is necessary if one seeks to describe the concept of law from the perspective of those over whom the law claims authority, then it is necessary to explain what is respectable about that legal authority. Showing what is respectable about a legal authority in turn involves at least partially justifying that legal authority. Accordingly, Perry concluded that in light of the inherent normativity of law, the object of description, Hart's pure descriptivism could not stand. Hart's most thorough defender has been Julie Dixon, who has argued not only that Hart's methodology is not nearly as unstable as Perry makes it appear, but that Hart's approach is in fact jurisprudence's proper methodology. Dixon accepts that Hart seeks to describe the concept of law and that doing so requires taking up the internal perspective of those working with and subject to law. But she steadfastly denies Perry's claim that describing the law from the internal perspective requires justifying law. While accepting that some form of evaluation is necessary in describing law, Dixon distinguishes between moral evaluation of the kind that marks a justification on the one hand and non-moral evaluation on the other. It is Dixon's view that legal theorists certainly do evaluate the data that they are trying to explicate, insofar that they are trying to explicate the significant and important data about law and not extraneous data. Dixon, moreover, contends that the legal theorist's evaluations must be attuned to what those persons who create, administer, and are subject to the law take to be significant and important about law. The systematization and clarification of the concept of law relies on just such theoretical evaluation. But Dixon is resolute in maintaining that evaluation of this kind is a far cry from the outright moral evaluation that Perry argues is necessary. Dixon's is an evaluative but not morally evaluative or what she terms indirectly evaluative jurisprudence. If Perry and Dixon have each staked out clear alternative positions in the methodology debate, Brian Leiter has significantly widened it by relating the debate to important developments in metaphysics and epistemology. Traditionally, jurisprudence has been concerned with a single animating question, namely the nature of law. 
Until Leiter's foray into the methodology debate, no one in the field questioned jurisprud jurisprudence's fundamental animating premise to it that law had a nature capable of explication. Adverting to W. V. O. Quine's famous paper, Two Dogmas of Empiricism and the Robust Empiricism that it ushered in, Leiter maintains that the idea that concepts have a nature or necessary structure or content is mistaken and that a priori inquiry into the concept of law, the very task that jurisprudence has traditionally set for itself, is therefore fundamentally misguided. Even if Quine is right, how do his arguments matter to analytic jurisprudence? Dworkin, recall, maintains that law's coercive power is essential to law and that it is that power that must be justified in any explication of the concept of law. This project assumes the defensibility of some form of conceptual analysis. In Tweed, Dworkin couches his project in precisely those terms. Legal positivists, too, engage in conceptual analysis. Joseph Raz writes, quote, inasmuch as a general theory of law is about the nature of law, it strives to elucidate law's essential features. That is, those features which are possessed by every legal system just in virtue of its being legal, by every legislative institution in virtue of its being legislative, and by every practice of legal reasoning in virtue of its being a practice of legal reasoning, and so on. A claim to necessity is in the nature of the enterprise." Close quote. If Quine is right, it would seem that neither Dworkin nor Raz can be right about methodology and legal theory. The reason is that claims to be describing the essential features of law depend for their efficacy on the analytic-synthetic distinction. If the analytic-synthetic distinction is untenable, as Quine maintains, then it would seem to follow that no project of conceptual analysis, whether Dworkinian interpretivist or positivist, gets off the ground. This thumbnail sketch of the recent history and current state of play in the methodology debate is, of course, simplified. There are many more players and theses than those just discussed. At the same time, the positions staked out by Perry, Dixon, and Leiter mark clear poles in the debate, and the framework provided by their positions is therefore a useful one. As currently structured, the methodology debate within analytic jurisprudence joins wider debates in the philosophy of language, epistemology, and metaphysics. Where do we locate Raz in the methodology debate? Vis-a-vis -vis the methodology debate, the simplest way to ask the question with respect to exclusive legal positivism is, what type of claim is Raz making on behalf of the service conception of authority and thus exclusive legal positivism? Although some read him, as, read him as making a moral argument, I think the more accurate characterization is that the claim he makes is conceptual or metaphysical. Raz himself has been somewhat equivocal on the matter, sometimes speaking of the concept of authority or our concept of authority or, or more recently, concepts in the plural of authority. Let us consider Raz's position from the point of view of the Quinean critique of conceptual claims. Rejecting claims to analyticity means rejecting all claims to the nature of the concept in question, in this case, law. There are no viable analytical, conceptual, or necessity claims when it comes to our concepts. When we give an account of concepts like law, the most we can be said to be doing is what Leiter disparagingly refers to as glorified lexicography. Is Raz doing glorified lexicography? I don't think so. Well, then what is he doing? I believe that what Raz needs to answer the question of the nature of law is a general theory of concepts. To answer the question of the nature of law, we need to know what sort of concept law is. Once we have answered this question, we can move on to the question of what sort of conceptual analysis is necessary for a concept like law. In short, a theory of concepts is a necessary preliminary to answer the, the question, what is the nature of law? The conventional metaphysical wisdom is that concepts divide up into at least two categories, natural kind concepts and artifactual kinds. Natural kind concepts are those whose essence is dictated by a microstructural element such as atomic formula or DNA. Artifactual kinds are the product of human invention. These social constructs are the stuff of John Searle's institutional facts. Their existence depends upon our attitudes or intentions. Where does Raz's account of the nature of law fall into this divide? It is, not, it is not at all clear. On the one hand, Raz says this about the nature of law, quote, a theory consists of necessary truths, 
for only necessary truths about the law reveal the nature of law. But Raz also maintains that, quote, in large measure what we study when we study the nature of law is the nature of our own self-understanding, close quote. It is difficult to see how necessary truths can arise out of the self-understanding of participants in a practice. Raz seems to want an account of the nature of law that identifies necessary truths at the same time it identifies something seemingly contingent about law, that is, our own self-understanding. Putting together necessity and contingency seems to me to be the next step in the development of exclusive legal positivism. This is perhaps one lesson of the current methodology debate. However Raz cashes out his claims for exclusive legal positivism and the nature of law, his account of authority will surely be a permanent fixture in the landscape of jurisprudence. In my remarks today, I have sought only to raise a few questions about Raz's unique and thoroughly original account of authority. Right or wrong, no one who considers either authority or the nature of law can do so without consideration of Raz's position and the claims he makes on behalf of exclusive legal positivism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Michael. I actually wanted to start uh, with an apology. When I got these comments together, I didn't think of a, a, the fact that Professor Raz was actually going to be in the audience. So I'm going to say a lot about what Raz would say in response, but that doesn't mean there's much of an upside for me because if I'm right, then uh, it's not so great and, and you'd really rather hear it from the original source. And if I'm wrong, he can definitively show that I'm wrong by saying he thinks otherwise. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll make my comments. Um, Professor Patterson considers uh, Raz's argument for exclusive legal positivism from two perspectives. First of all, he points to the role of interpretation in legal reasoning to question whether Raz's argument works at all. And then he takes sort of a second order uh, uh, or higher order perspective to consider the nature of Raz's argument. Is it a form of conceptual analysis? And if it is, what would his response be to the methodology debate in jurisprudence, for example, uh, Brian Leiter's Quining critique of conceptual analysis and so on. I mean, these are both very, very big topics, so um, I'm going to have to be uh, very sketchy in my response. Um, so to start with the question about whether uh, interpretation on the basis of evaluative criteria is compatible with exclusive legal positivism. Exclusive legal positivism is the view that all law is source-based. That is, that its existence and content can be identified by reference to social facts without evaluative argument. Patterson offers as a possible counterexample the Supreme Court deciding whether executing a minor for a crime is compatible with the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. The court's decision, he rightly says, would involve interpretation according to evaluative uh, criteria. Now, one might think that Patterson's point is the following, and this has been said, uh, um, uh, this has been offered as a, a counterexample to Raz. We might think that Patterson's point is the following. Since the Eighth Amendment clearly refers to moral criteria, namely whether the uh, uh, punishment is cruel and unusual, and obligates judges to adjudicate in accordance with that, uh, uh, those criteria, the law must incorporate morality. It seems obvious that it incorporates morality. Now, I don't think that's Patterson's uh, point, but I think it's useful to start out by discussing this, uh, uh, this example and what Raz's response would be to it. Uh, Raz thinks that constitutional provisions, or I think he thinks the constitutional provisions that refer to moral standards are compatible with exclusive legal positivism for two related reasons. First of all, the mere fact that a standard is referred to by the law and judges are obligated to adjudicate in accordance with that standard doesn't mean the standard itself is the law. Um, one example, although there are others, uh, American conflicts of law rules uh, can obligate judges to decide cases in accordance with Polish law, for example, but that doesn't make Polish law American law. Or uh, judges are obligated to enforce private contracts, but that doesn't make the private contracts uh, a law. They're legally enforced, but they're not themselves law. So that's the first point. I've got to admit, I'm a little bit uh, uh, confused by that point, at least. Uh, I'm confused about the analogy between uh, morality and foreign law that I believe uh, Raz is trying to make. Uh, and I'd really be happy if you could say a little bit more about this. The second point, though, seems to me to be uh, uh, pretty clear. Statutes and governmental actions are not legally invalid when they violate the moral standards that are referred to in constitutional provisions like the Eighth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment. The, the statutes or, and the governmental actions remain legally valid until a court strikes them down upon such grounds. 
And this is in, uh, compatible with exclusive legal positivism because the fact that the court has exercised such power, the power of judicial review, is a social fact. So the Eighth Amendment would have to be understood in the following way. It doesn't make moral standards law. Rather, it directs judges to use moral standards to determine whether laws ought to be invalidated or not. And that is uh, so described as compatible with uh, exclusive legal positivism. Of course, what I've just described is a way of making such provisions compatible with exclusive legal positivism. It's, it's not an argument for exclusive legal positivism. I mean, Raz himself actually says that it's possible for foreign law to be given such uh, a domestic legal effect that it actually becomes domestic law. He thinks, for example, that the rights enumerated within the European Convention on Human Rights were incorporated into the law of the United Kingdom in its Human Rights Act of 1998. So uh, the question still remains why foreign law can become domestic law, but morality can't become domestic law. Uh, and with respect to the same point, or an analogous point, is true with respect to judicial review. Not every standard in a constitution, standard for validity of law in a constitution, is enforced through the mechanism of judicial review. For example, failure to satisfy the presentment clause in Article 1, Section 7 makes a putative law invalid ab initio. The fact that both houses of Congress have not uh, um, ratified the law means it is not a law, and that doesn't have to be determined through the exercise of judicial review. It's just uh, a nullity from the very beginning. So the question remains, why can't a legal system exist in which failure to satisfy a moral standard makes a law invalid ab initio? And I really think that this needs to be the uh, example um, uh, focused upon, because the minute you get uh, courts exercising judicial review, I think the, the matter becomes uh, uh, confused. All right, well, so what is Raz's argument for exclusive legal positivism? Here I'm just going to uh, sort of repeat uh, what Dennis has said. Although the law uh, can fail to have authority, according to uh, Raz, it necessarily claims authority and thus necessarily must be capable of having authority. Uh, and a characteristic of authority is that following an authority's directives makes one more likely to abide by one's pre-existing reasons for action than trying to act upon those reasons directly. This is Raz's uh, service uh, conception of authority, which is spelled out in the morality of freedom. Uh, so it's necessary for authority that obedience not require, it may as a side effect, but it not require consideration of these pre-existing reasons for action. But according to Raz, that's exactly what the incorporation of morality in law would do, is require the consideration of these pre-existing reasons for action. Now, for the record, I, I don't find Raz's argument persuasive, uh, uh, not for reasons that, uh, um, uh, that Dennis mentions, but first of all, I, I would question whether the law necessarily claims authority. Uh, I think a legal system could exist, that would have a law, um, even if its uh, functionaries just claimed the raw power to coerce obedience. They didn't claim authority over, over uh, uh, its subjects. Um, and furthermore, assuming that the law necessarily claims authority, I don't think it necessarily has to be capable of having it. I mean, this sounds like a psychological claim to me, and it seems to me psychologically possible to claim all, thing, all kinds of things that you don't have the capacity to have. People seem to do that all the time. They're um, self-deceived. Uh, thirdly, I would question whether the incorporation of morality into law would mean that those subject to the law would be compelled to consider the very reasons for action that the law is meant to displace. And, and here I'm going to steal an argument from uh, Jules Coleman. He, I'm not sure it's the best argument, but it, it, uh, our best example. Um, he says uh, a legal restriction in the fairness of the administration of the law prohibiting murder doesn't have to refer to the underlying reasons for action that the law prohibiting murder was meant to displace. So you've got a moral condition for uh, uh, the law, but it's not displacing the underlying uh, uh, reasons for action. Sorry, but doesn't refer to the underlying reasons for action that were displaced by the law. But anyway, let's set aside uh, my objections, which are none of which are novel. I mean, they've been made against Ras a, a lot by um, better philosophers than me. Uh, but let's set aside these uh, objections to consider Patterson's criticism now. As we've seen, if Patterson's point is merely that the Eighth Amendment refers to morality, it's not sufficient to show that exclusive legal positivism is false, because he's got an explanation of the Eighth Amendment that's compatible with it. Um, but that's not Patterson's point. Um, he doesn't think that the Eighth Amendment clearly refers to morality. He notes that the court, when interpreting the Eighth Amendment, may come to the conclusion that it refers to something non-moral. For example, what the founders thought was cruel and unusual punishment, which is a, a question of social fact. But in coming to this conclusion, he says, the court would be still be engaging in interpretation according to evaluative criteria. Because choosing one or another interpretive uh, approach would implicate evaluative concerns. 
Now, uh, first of all, in evaluating uh, his criticism, we have to keep in mind that Raz accepts that reasoning about how a court ought to decide a case often involves interpretation according to evaluative criteria. What he rejects is that one must engage in such interpretation in order to identify the content of the law. The law is autonomous, but legal reasoning is not. So it is, I mean, the easiest example is a court can fill in the gaps of the law on the basis of evaluative criteria. Uh, nobody disagrees that that, that that happens, but that wouldn't be an example of the court identifying the content of the law according to evaluative criteria. So for Patterson's criticism, criticism to work, we have to understand the court as using moral criteria to determine the content of the Eighth Amendment. The decision that it makes is actually about what the, the Eighth Amendment's content is. And I do believe that that's what uh, uh, Dennis says, actually, is that the court is reasoning about the content of the Eighth Amendment. Uh, one way of thinking about Patterson's criticism is that he's saying that interpretation on the basis of moral criteria is so pervasive that such interpretation cannot, if, that if such interpretation is not about the content of the law, the law becomes virtually contentless. We couldn't say that the Eighth Amendment has the role to which Raz would assign it, for we wouldn't be able to determine whether it refers to a moral or a non-moral standard for judicial review. Now, I can't say very uh, much in the, uh, the time that we've got about, um, uh, about Dennis's criticism, but I want to say a few things. Um, first of all, as, as uh, he himself notes, one might simply deny that evaluative interpretation is really so crucial in determining the content of the law, including the Eighth Amendment. We might be able to just come up with a, a view about the content of the Eighth Amendment without engaging in such evaluative uh, interpretation. But secondly, I think this is more important. Um, I don't think Raz is committed to the idea that the Eighth Amendment and analogous uh, um, uh, constitutional provisions have that much content to them. Um, given his sympathies with Kelsen um, and the idea that adjudication is the creation of law, he might think of the Eighth Amendment as primarily being jurisdictional, that is, just giving to courts the power to uh, engage in judicial review on the basis of criteria of their own devising, subject to very, very minimal restrictions, namely that they've got to refer to the text of the Eighth Amendment or something along those lines. I mean, there might be some, something more there, but not very much. Uh, and so to the extent that they're saying anything more about the content of the Eighth Amendment, um, they're actually not referring to the content of the Eighth Amendment at all, but rather engaging in law creation. Thirdly, and I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this point, but I'm going to just say it anyway, um, even if Raz were to admit that moral considerations must be taken into account to determine the content of the Eighth Amendment, so this is a big concession on his part, and I don't think it's one that he would make, that actually still doesn't mean that exclusive legal positivism is false, for it doesn't yet follow that these moral considerations that the court's taking into account are themselves law. Uh, and I, I believe this is a helpful analogy, maybe it isn't. Dworkin himself has offered a position which he calls conventionalism. I think that's somewhat misleading. But uh, according to this view, all law is source-based, but it's a value of reasoning that leads one to such a conclusion. So it's an exclusive legal positivist view, but moral uh, uh, interpretation is what leads you to this conclusion. So if pushed to a into a corner, Raz might adopt such a view himself. As I said, I don't think he's uh, going to. I, I, I believe his position would be uh, uh, this sort of Kelsanian one, that this act of interpretation that the court's engaging in is just filling in the gaps of the Eighth Amendment. All right, now let's move on to the um, uh, conceptual analysis point. Patterson makes a number of observations concerning Raz's jurisprudential method, all of which I believe are correct. First of all, Raz understands, understands himself as analyzing the concept of law, or a concept of law. Secondly, he takes such analysis to be descriptive, in the sense that it doesn't require moral justification of the law. Thirdly, he believes that an analysis of the concept of law can reveal essential or necessary features of law Fourth, he nevertheless believes that our concept of law is contingent in the sense that it depends upon our society's self-understanding. Now, Patterson's primarily interested in describing uh, Raz's uh, method and describing the challenges of the method posed by philosophers of law such as Stephen Perry and, and Brian Leiter, but he does briefly, actually, I don't know if you, I, I wasn't actually listening, I don't know if you make this criticism in your paper, you might have skipped it, but I'll, it was in the paper that, that I read. He makes the following, uh, uh, he questions the coherence of Raz's position uh, briefly, saying that it's hard to see how necessary truths can arise out of the self-understanding of participants in a practice. Did you actually, yeah. he did say that, okay, good. Um, oh, everything's okay. Everything's okay, right. <laughs> in the time that I have, I want to very briefly defend Raz's uh, method against this uh, brief criticism by Patterson and against uh, uh, defend Raz's method against Leiter's critique of conceptual analysis. I'm not going to say anything uh, about uh, Perry here. So to start with the uh, Leiter's point, 
Leiter often mentions how embarrassing it is uh, that years after Quine's critique of the analytic synthetic distinction, uh, philosophers are still analyzing concepts. I believe, actually, the embarrassment is really Quine's and Leiter's. Um, Quine argues against analyticity by attacking the idea of synonymy, that is, sameness of meaning. But Quine's argument against synonymy is intimately tied to his view about the radical indeterminacy of meaning generally. And that's not a view that's widely shared by philosophers. So there's a reason, uh, a philosophical reason, why people don't buy into Quine's argument. Uh, for those who think that linguistic items can have determinate meanings, and that we can know what these meanings are, it just seems crazy to say that it's impossible to know that two items have the same meaning. You would know that they have the same meaning, or they don't have the same meaning, by virtue of knowing what their meanings are. As Paul Bogosian has put it, how can there be a fact of the matter about what each expression means, but no fact of the matter about whether they mean the same thing? Uh, indeed, it would appear that our knowledge of two occur the two occurrences of the same word, green and green, for example, are synonymous, shows that Quine's wrong. If meaning were indeterminate, we wouldn't know that this was a true, or this would be something that would be uh, uh, confirmed uh, uh, by experience or evidence. It's not surprising, therefore, that philosophers like Raz ignore Quine's critique and continue analyzing meanings and the contents of concepts. Nor is conceptual analysis cast into doubt by the bad track record of a priori reasoning about reality. Leiter's very fond of mentioning uh, this. He, uh, an example that he brings up a lot is that Kant, for example, thought it was true a priori that space necessarily had the structure described in Euclidean geometry. Uh, but Kant characterized his claims about Euclidean geometry as synthetic a priori. And the reason why he did is because he knew that the analysis of concepts wasn't going to give you any knowledge about reality. Um, now, just because Kant was wrong about synthetic a priori truths doesn't impugn conceptual analysis. So I think there's a real straw man argument going on here. Uh, so once we understand the analysis of concepts and meanings as having no existential import, doesn't tell you anything about the nature of reality, it's a lot less problematic to treat it as, um, as uh, providing you with necessary truths. The necessity is a characteristic of the content of the concept. It's a, it's a claim, really, about an abstract object. To say that according to Kant's concept of space, for example, space is necessarily Euclidean, is perfectly compatible with saying that his concept fails to pick out anything in reality, there is no such space out there, and that there's another concept of space, according to which it is necessarily non-Euclidean, that describes what the world is actually like. So I think this is how Raz would answer uh, Patterson's criticism. Our concept of law is contingent, but that doesn't undermine any claims of necessity, for the claims are pegged to our concept of law. The problem is that if this is the position that Raz takes, uh, why bother trying to discover the necessary characteristics of the law at all? Such claims of necessity don't tell us anything about what the world is like, and furthermore, there are other concepts of law, maybe an infinite number of concepts of law, according to which the law has a different set of necessary characteristics. We seem to be running into what uh, Ronald Dworkin calls the semantic sting, that is, disagreements about the content of concepts becomes trivial because it's just a decision to redefine what the concept is about. Uh, now, one way that this problem can be solved, and I, uh, Dennis was sort of referring to this, and I know that this is the way that uh, Dworkin goes, is to put a restriction on our power to determine the concept, content of our own concepts. We can meaningfully disagree about the content of concepts because we are not in complete control of what it is we're thinking about. Certainly, the natural kind term approach uh, is, uh, is such an approach. Uh, we can meaningfully disagree about whether water is H2O or not uh, as a conceptual matter because our concept of water is determined by something external to us, the nature of, of uh, some paradigm sample of water, for example. And I think uh, Dworkin's interpretive semantics is also another example. We don't have complete control over the content of our concepts. But I think Raz would answer the semantic sting uh, problem differently. Uh, I think he would claim that we are limited in our choice of the concept of law, not by a semantic theory, but by the contingent fact, uh, uh, but a sort of calcitrant fact, uh, namely our, our society's self-understanding. Consider the analogous problem of the semantic sting as applied to our concept of bachelor. Um, I take it that uh, Rowan, my two-year-old son, is not a bachelor. Uh, even though he is an unmarried male. 
So that means that there's some criteria for bachelorhood beyond being unmarried and a, a, a male. They're, they're part of our concept of a bachelor. Now it's true that our concept of bachelor might have been the concept of an unmarried male simpliciter. That's all there was to the concept. Um, not only might we have such a concept, I actually have it right now. I've just thought it, right? It's clearly possible for me to have such a concept. Um, that said, we have made a choice about what concept to associate with the word bachelor. And it's more than that. What is sort of salient for us when we talk about bachelors? And we don't really seem to be interested just in talking about unmarried males, because we usually talk about bachelors. When we're talking about them, we're talking about it sometimes in connection with sexual activity and so on. It just is inappropriate to talk about a two-year-old as a bachelor. So there are all kinds of commitments uh, that we have that are uh, tied up to our concept uh, of the bachelor, uh, although it is a, a contingent concept. Um, so the choice is contingent, but it's intertwined in our life in a way that makes it resistant to change. And I, I believe this is what Raz would say with respect to our concept of law. In fact, it would seem that it's even more entrenched in our uh, lives because it's intertwined with our legal institutions. That doesn't mean that we can't have law without our concept of law, um, which Dworkin, for example, I, I believe has said. Um, in fact, our concept of law tells us that this isn't true. We can imagine legal systems that don't have the concept of law. In other words, they have the law according to our concept, but the people who have law don't have our concept of law. But the fact still remains that our concept of law is intertwined with our legal institutions and our self-understanding. And so it's not a, the sort of thing that we can uh, consistently at least change as well. I can think of any concepts I want right now, but it's not the kind of thing that I can do uh, consistently and engage uh, um, in uh, legal activities, for example. So with respect to the question of which concept of law we should analyze, that's all the restriction, I believe, according to RAS, that we have uh, or that we, that we need at all. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. I, I, I'm sure that your two-year-old son is not an eligible bachelor. Right? Um, well, I imagine that uh, Professor Patterson would like to respond. I invite him to do so. I'll just take a, a few minutes um, to make, uh, make, make a few points. And uh, Michael was very generous in sharing his comments with me uh, in advance. So uh, I've had a chance to reflect on, on his, his critique, for which I'm very grateful. Um, OK. Um, th there's, a, there's an important point that I want to make about, uh, I, I thought I made it in the paper, but I, I want to emphasize it, that um, it's not the case that, that evaluative criteria, the phrase that, that Raz uses, is coextensive with moral criteria. And it, it, seems, it seems that in, in Michael's um, critique sometimes, and, and certainly in discussions of, of what uh, Joseph is, is taken to claim, that evaluative claims are always moral. That's not my point. My point about the Eighth Amendment example is that you have evaluative criteria that are interpretive, right? So interpretive criteria are a kind of evaluative, non-moral criteria. Things like, and these appear regularly in legal reasoning, comprehensiveness, right? We decide among interpretations by the degree to which they have reached. They go to different departments of law, as Dworkin would put it. Minimal mutilation, the classic Quinean uh, web of belief, epistemic virtue. We always reject interpretations which destroy or put into question areas of a body of doctrine about which we have no question. That's a reason for rejecting them. That's a, that is an evaluative criterion. It is non-moral. Consistency. To what degree is a decision taken one way consistent with everything else we take to be true about a given department of law? These three are what I would maintain are, are evaluative, non-moral criteria that arise in the interpretive legal context. And it seems to me that you can't answer the question, what is the content of law, in many cases, without using these criteria to decide what the content of law is. Now, I really love this distinction. Law is autonomous, legal reasoning is not. That, with all due respect, is question begging because the debate is about what the word law means in the claim law is autonomous. And so I think that's just an invitation for, for debate about these issues. Secondly, 
about naturalism and quine. Um, I am not a quinean, but I think, and this is a sociological claim, quine is the most important philosopher of the 20th century. The current, the current milieu, uh, certainly in my department at Rutgers, where Jerry Fodor says Wittgenstein is the worst thing that ever happened to philosophy. Quote, all right? Um, naturalism, the reduction of the intentional, the epistemic um, consciousness to the physical, that's what naturalism is. This is the reigning paradigm in um, philosophy today. Just think about um, people like Dennett, um, Searle, the philosophy of mind, mind and brain, they're just the same thing. I mean, this is the paradigm. So, and, and Quine, Quine is, the, Quine is the progenitor of this, right? Um, because Quine is regarded widely as having reduced philosophy from the queen of the sciences to basically um, the provider of vocabulary. So, um, with respect to Joseph's claims about necessity. What I really want to know is, what exactly are you talking about? When you say law has, quote, necessary content, what do you mean? You clearly can't mean Kripkean a posteriori analytic truths, like water, right? Why is Kripke a genius? Why is he the, why is he the, the hero in Scott Soames's two-volume history of, the, of analytic philosophy? because he reintroduced necessity into the analytic philosophy tradition. He's great because he's the only person who answered Quine. And he did it in a way that nobody expected. Who, who in 19, 1970 would have thought it was possible to come up with an argument that showed the truth of a posteriori analytic necessity? Nobody, right? Because Quine reigned supreme. That's what Kripke did. Now, I think when Joseph uses the word necessity, He's not talking about that. And I'd like to know, what is it that, that, he's, that he's talking about? Because law is what I would call a hermeneutic concept. Hermeneutic in the sense that the law does not, when we talk about law and legal things, we're not adding to the furniture of the universe, right? Law is a matter of intentions, practices, coordinated activities, like arguments, claims, and the like, right? But if there's any necessity in law, it has to be of a different kind different order than the necessity you find in natural kinds in the natural world, the kind of stuff that Kripke's talking about. So I'm interested in the question, is there any necessity in law uh, at all? And if there is, what kind, what kind is it? So um, I think that Quine is wrong, but for, for different reasons than um, some of the criticisms that, that, that Michael rightly uh, raises. But even if Quine's wrong, that still doesn't answer the question when people make claims about the necessary features of law. What is it that they're talking about? What is the argument, other than just some kind of hand-waving and appeal to intuition? That's not what Joseph does, but many people do that. They just say, well, I consult my intuitions and here's what I find. And remarkably, it's consistent with the argument I just made, right? He doesn't do that, but I want to nudge him along and say, gee, what are you doing? And what sort of claim are you making? Sure, sure. Yeah, just a, cu a couple uh, points. I, I completely agree that there are evaluative criteria that are implicated when we identify the existence and content of the law. And we can use that even in just t take the simplest example uh, that the speed limit is 55 miles per hour. I'm not going to be able to identify that um, uh, without uh, bringing uh, certain presuppositions, and we can call them evaluative if we like, uh, into play, consistency, and, and so on. So I completely agree with that. But then the question is whether that's at all a reason to question exclusive legal positivism, because you can say that the law is entirely source-based, that is, that it can be uh, uh, what you're identifying with social facts, but the process of identification is something that's going to implicate these type of evaluative concerns. So it doesn't seem to me that that point is actually a criticism uh, of RAS. Um, and in particular, it doesn't seem to me that the values that are at issue here are the values that the, um, uh, are the pre-existing reasons for action that the law was meant to displace according to uh, Raz's theory of law, right? And you need that for there to be a problem, uh, it seems to me, with Raz's, uh, 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 problem with Raz's exclusive legal positivism. 
Uh, about the naturalism point, I just want to say one thing. I, I just have difficulty understanding what uh, a naturalistic jurisprudence would actually look like. Um, I mean, I understand how we might say that uh, the content of our concept of water is, uh, uh, is something that's going to be uh, up to the um, uh, uh, confirmation of experience, whether it's going to tie into other scientific theories and so on. I understand what that means, but I don't understand what it would mean in connection with uh, the law, because it just strikes me that the law is not a kind of thing or concept that has the same form of empirical confirmation. I'll just give an example. I mean, I'm sort of ragging on uh, lighter here, I think, but I'll give you an example of what I think is problematic when um, uh, somebody tries to come up with a naturalized jurisprudence. Uh, lighter says uh, that uh, the legal realists are an example of a naturalized jurisprudence because their concept of law is tied to an empirical concern, namely a theory of adjudication, the question of whether the law accurately predicts adjudicative decisions or not. And he said, uh, and I understand that being an empirical question, but he says that the realists had an empirical understanding of what the law was that was tied to these, uh, um, uh, to these predictive questions. But the problem is, according to uh, the legal realist theories of adjudication, there's actually no relationship between, or very little relationship between the law and adjudic adjudicative decisions. What the realists, the conclusion they came to, was that the law doesn't accurately predict adjudicative decisions. Well, that doesn't strike me as an example where a concept of law is confirmed by experience. It seems to be disconfirmed in this case. So I don't think the example that Leiter has tried to give of an empirically confirmed concept of law is a good one, because it seems to me to be an empirically disconfirmed concept of law. And I honestly just don't know what the alternative is. Maybe this is a failure of imagination on my part, but I don't really understand what it means for there to be naturalized jurisprudence. So it just doesn't seem to me to be odd at all that philosophers of law would engage in old-fashioned conceptual analysis, because I don't understand uh, what the alternative would be. Great. Uh Okay, we're going to open it up now to you. Um, is the yes? If if someone would grab that mic, we'll have to pass it around uh, as we did this morning, earlier this morning. And uh, who would who would like it first? Time for lunch. <laughs> Professor Tollison. I just have two. Uh, brief and I think related questions. One, the first is more a point, and I'm not sure how much mileage you can get out of it. But although it seems to me true that artifacts, unlike organisms or even gold, don't have natures, it's, it doesn't seem to me that that means that there are not conceptual truths about artifacts. So a watch doesn't have a nature, but it's conceptually true that a watch has something to do with time, right, with the measure of time. And it just seems to me a conceptual truth. Um, now, so that's the—I mean—that's the first part, part. Can you get now? Can you get mileage out of that? I'm not sure, but it, it seems to me that you can get at least some. And if you want to understand watches, if you want to talk about watches, that set of conceptual truths that we can uh, gather together about watches is not going to be very helpful to us until we start understanding why we might have wanted something to be able to tell time until we understand various aspects about the purposes that we were trying to, trying to satisfy. And then it looks to me like we get kind of a nice link up between the conceptual truths and the account of purposes. Given this set of purposes, a certain set of conceptual truths seems to make sense, right? I mean, it, it's true that we could have called something else a watch, but then it wouldn't be serving those purposes. And it's true that if you know, if, if, if things didn't have these sorts of features, then they wouldn't serve these pictures. So they just, it just wouldn't fit into the, the general picture of watches. Now, the, the thing that I, I'm just wondering about, um, because I, I'm, it just may be orthogonal to what you're, what you're saying, but if, if that kind of an account of a watch is right, you need to have the conceptual truths, you need to see how the conceptual truths are related to the purposes. Discussion of the purposes, it seems to me, is intrinsically normative and evaluative. Then it looks to me like, the conceptual and the evaluative are, are very closely linked. And, and it also looks to me like that's what Raz says. Um, when he talks about the service conception of authority, he says uh, the service concept, the service conception is a normative doctrine about the conditions under which authority is legitimate. Is not that a confusion of conceptual analysis and normative argument? The answer is that there is an interdependence between conceptual and normative argument. That seems plausible to me, and, and I'm wondering, and it, 
if that connection between the two in Raz's work is missing in Dennis, what your your description, or if I'm looking at a different level of, of what Raz is talking about than what you are. Okay. Um, well, with respect to the, the conceptual and the evaluative, I'll take the second point first. <clears throat> I do think it's the case that uh, in, in the morality of freedom and in all the subsequent places where the service conception of authority is developed and it's ultimately wedded to exclusive legal positivism that, um, that Raz is making uh, a point that has normative purchase. That is to say, he is explaining the normative nature of law or he's explaining the nature of a normative concept, law. But his argument is not a normative argument. He's not saying that um, his account of authority is attractive for substantive normative reasons. He's saying that his, his account is attractive because it is driven by the necessity that he claims for the account in explicating the nature of law. So um, I think the conceptual and the, and the evaluative are related, and I think they're related in just that, in just that way but maybe later we'll have confirmation of that, uh, whether you or I or a third position is uh, closer to the truth. Um, now, with respect to the first point, uh, art, you, you said that, um, that, uh, there's a connect, that noticing that there's a connection between watches and telling time is a conceptual truth. I, I guess I would disagree with that. that. That's an empirical observation, that people who tell time often look at something on their wrist or I guess if you're, under, if you're under 25, you look at your cell phone apparently. This is why the sales of watches apparently are going down, so I read. Um, so I, I would say that that's an empirical observation. Now, I think this is, this is the way I'd like to, I'd like to engage your question. Um, and this, this goes to, I think, what is a, an important issue in, in, in legal theory. Um, you don't need a theory of time to know what time it is. But if you're a legal philosopher, many believe, I'm not one of them, that you need a theory of law in order to do law. I think this is fundamentally wrong. Uh, yet this is the principal claim that's made by people who do legal philosophy. And this cuts across positivists and interpretivists alike. So I think law is like time, it's like numbers, I, I know how to count, but I don't need a theory of numbers, whether they're an abstract Meinongian object or something else, to know uh, how to do my taxes. Well, that's probably a bad example. Um, how to do sums, right? I don't need a theory of what a number is, okay? But um, I do think that a lot of what drives this debate is the, is the presupposition that in order to do law, you have to have a theory of law to give an account of what law is. You need a theory, an abstract theory, and uh, well, theory by its nature is abstract, and that I think is a is a very um, uh, is, is a very contestable claim, and yet I think that um, a lot of the debate you know, has two levels. One, what's the right theory of law, and the, the question that ever gets asked is, do we need a theory of law to actually give an account of law? I think the answer is no. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your comment. Uh, actually, I, so I'm not really going to respond to it, but to say something that's sort Surely of uh, motivated by, um, by this distinction that, um, uh, that Dennis makes between artifactual and, and natural kinds. I, I was just a little bit confused by that because it, the distinction seems to refer to the objects that the concepts are about. But if that's true, that, there's got to be way more concepts than that. I mean, there, there's certainly other things besides natural kinds and artifacts. There's all kinds of, uh, of other things out there. I can refer to numbers, for example, which aren't artifacts, I don't think, uh, and they're not natural kinds either. So what I would take is the, is the distinction here is between natural kind terms and criterial terms. That is, terms whose content or, or concepts whose content is determined by the criteria that are associated with uh, the concept uh, at, at the time. Natural kind terms are different because, uh, uh, at least according to this theory of natural kind terms, their meaning will outstrip what people have in their heads at any particular time. Back in the 17th century, um, uh, people thought water was an odor, odorless, colorless, potable liquid. 
Uh, but they were actually, according to this theory, they were the content of their concept of water was H2O. Uh, and we have the same content to our concept of water that they had back then. So that's one understanding of, of concepts, a certain type of concept. And then the alternative, I don't think would be artifactual, but rather, um, uh, rather criterial. And it does seem to me, I'm going to put uh, words into Professor Raz's mouth, but it does seem to me that he's working with a criterial conception of, of what uh, concepts are. Um, uh, that is that we find out what, a co what are the content of our concept of law is by plumbing the criteria that, uh, that we're uh, currently associating with the, the concept. I don't know whether that's helpful or not. But. Okay. Uh, Professor Waldron. And just on the um, last point that Dennis made about the importance of a, having a concept of law in order to make legal judgments and engage in legal reasoning, one could accept, I think, fairly easily that individuals don't need to have a theory of law in order to participate uh, in a legal system. I'm not sure how far one would want to say that a community can't have a legal system without there being a degree of self-consciousness about what it is that they are doing and a degree of reflective theorizing uh, about it. I could imagine somebody taking the hardline Patterson position even on that, but it looks less easy to argue for, and it may well be the case that if it's false, if a legal system does require a certain degree of self-consciousness, one would expect there to be certain roles in that system that would engage such self-consciousness more than more than uh, others, and perhaps high appellate judges uh, would be one, legislators would be uh, another. So that was just a, a small point. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether one would want to say that a community could have a legal system in an entirely theoretically unselfconscious way. I'm not sure what, what you mean, though, by a community having a legal system. Do you, do you mean that, that appellate judges, um, appellate judges disagree with one another about whether they should wait for the vacuum to stop? No, no, I just simply meant, I mean, New Zealand has a legal system, I know that for sure. No, no, I, uh, it also has a, a tradition of jurisprudence, right. or it participates in broader traditions of jurisprudence. Could we imagine uh, the first without the second? And I think it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's no big deal, Dennis, and I, 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 it just seemed to me to be wrong to state the issue purely at the, in, at the level of individual participants, because right. law I, is something we do together on any account. Right. Law is something you do together. That's certainly true. But, but um, my claim is, is that you don't have to theorize law to do it together. Nobody I, has to theorize law in order for us to do it together. Right. Exactly. That you can have the kinds of arguments that um, they have at the Supreme Court all the time or up the street in the municipal court, um, and, you, and you can conduct it in the, in, the, in, in the grammar of legal justification with which we're all familiar, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be... Okay. Theoretical people who want to who want to make the claim that um, you can't do this without having some theory of how it all hangs together. That's the part that I'm skeptical of. Sure. I, so so I just wanted to see whether the skepticism was pitched at that level as well. And evidently, it is. Here's, here's the question I wanted to ask: Are you at all attracted by this view, which I think I learned from Raz, but he bears no necessary responsibility for it? that judges who somehow had been mysteriously empowered to review penal statutes might have been left to their own devices as to the criteria on which they review them, in which case, like anybody who faces a serious moral decision, they would have to consider their cruelty and their fairness and their proportionality and their prudence and a whole array of, of uh, moral and evaluative issues. That's what people normally do. That's the default position, right? Right. And the express terms of the Eighth Amendment that um, direct attention to cruelty and unusualness, right. they kind of place a, a mask over most of that. It's kind of as, uh, as though they say something to the judge, let us take care of the fairness issue. Let us take care of the prudence issue. So we've placed a mask over that, but the mask has holes in it, and the cruelty whole is there, and in that domain of making an assessment about cruelty, the judge's decision-making and reasoning is unaffected by positive law. 
So positive law defines the mask, but it doesn't define what happens in the holes. Right. What happens in the holes is that the judge just goes on as he would anyway and make right. a judgment about the cruelty. It's just that the law has precluded him from considering the prudence right. or the wisdom. Right. And that doesn't require any talk of incorporation. It right. requires only that, um, that uh, positive law be clear enough to make it clear when you are left to your own devices right. or on what you are left to your own devices and what you are right. not. And I, I mean, I think this is a reasonable view. It's, a, I think, a better alternative than the more inclusive positivist approach because it, it, it understands that the default mode of, of any human being confronted with any important decision is to make uh, judgments about the whole array of evaluative issues that are arising. The task of positive law is not to be hostile to that, but sometimes to channel it, sometimes to control it, sometimes to preclude it, sometimes to facilitate it by saying, um, look at it with this particular pair of concepts, cruel and unusual. After all, we could have asked you to consider whether uh, to strike down punishments that are, that are um, I don't know, bizarre but imprudent. Or, but we're given a particular, we're given direction here. Keep doing your moral reasoning within this narrowly defined framework. I think maybe, I mean, I, I just wonder what your view is about that that proposal, which, which as I say, I, I learned from Raz, whether it's exactly his view, I don't know. But um, one of the things I think that's very important about that view is that it doesn't understand exclusive legal positivism to be in any sense hostile to moralizing it, but it masks channels, I mean masks as in when one, one uh, is painting a wall and you put masking tape over certain parts and not others because you want to leave the others as they were. It masks channels, facilitates sometimes precludes, sometimes controls, and therefore, as it were, makes moralizing, particularly, again, by a community, not just right. by one individual, um, better or easier or more useful in some right. sense. Yeah, I think I have two problems with, the, with that picture. First is that it, it, it looks, it, it, it seems to separate um, the values that a judge would have from the law, the law being the, the cloth that's dropped over the, the, the the self-reflective moral process that the judge engages in. And um, I mean, maybe it's just, a, I, I don't want to make this uh, turn on an, an empirical judgment, but um, a, lot of what, a lot of what goes on in law occurs and necessarily has to occur in a common vocabulary. The old saw that we can't disagree until we agree about something, right? Our disagreement to get off the ground pre presupposes all kinds of things. And the, um, the structure of argument that I described in my, in my comments is that common vocabulary. And it's not possible, it wouldn't be possible for people to have, for judges to have an argument without some kind of framework against, uh, against which they make the argument. I mean, if a judge comes in and, uh, and appeals to um, the Koran as the basis for her decision as to how the case should come out, that's going to be summarily rejected. Uh, the substantive values notwithstanding. Why? Because that, that, that text is not something that's recognized as legitimate. Now this extreme example um, I give you just to make the point that um, the picture that you describe doesn't seem to have a place for the intersubjective nature of argument that seems to me to be so very much uh, a part of the law. And if that wasn't, if that wasn't there, I don't see how legal argument could get off the could get off the ground. Yeah. yeah Can I just yeah. just briefly respond to that? I mean, I think that's very important, and there may well be cases where we are so alarmed by the prospect of of chaotic and haphazard argument among different officials in the legal system that we attempt to to control or limit that argumentation altogether, and we say, no, no, just apply a 55 mile an hour rule. We don't want your Quranic interpretations of appropriate speeds or your uh, biblical interpretations of appropriate speeds. This is likely to be so disorderly if we let that get going that we will control it. In other areas, we don't feel the same need. We may feel a need to channel it or direct it in a certain way. But again, the exclusive legal positivist need not be in quite the panic-stricken mode about moral argumentation among different officials that you suggest, sometimes he may well be, and sometimes the, 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 the line is, we're going to coordinate at all on this stuff, or if we're going to sort of uh, have any sort of line that we're holding, we have to mask, in the sense, the, 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 um, 
the, uh, the area of disagreement altogether and just replace it with a rule. And then, of course, there'll be further questions about how we interpret the rule. But on some occasions, the, the thought may be, we would rather take the risks of facilitating and licensing an open-ended debate about cruelty than, as it were, try to close down that issue prematurely. Because sometimes, given what we know of um, the culture in 1791 and any culture likely to flourish uh, on this continent, we know there is likely to be an ongoing debate about cruelty. And it would be advisable not to preclude that, but to focus, focus uh, specifically on that, and therefore leave room for that argument that would be going on anyway among people who can more or less understand one another and not use positive law to preclude that, but to frame and channel it. So, uh, I mean, just, just um, I, I hear you be saying something along the lines of, um, with respect to things like cruel and unusual, it would be better to have an argument in a democratic forum about what it means rather than to have a process like judicial review where we give the question to nine people and say... No, I'm sorry. I, 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 didn't, no. I, mean, I, I mean, I do believe that, but, but, but that's not what I wanted to say here. I assume, just for the sake of argument, that somehow, for some idiotic reason, we have decided to empower judges on these matters. And you know I have peculiar views yeah. on this. And, and we, we have somehow said to one another, it's not that we have a list of punishments in mind that we want to prevent. We know that punishment is a potentially cruel business. And we want there to be um, mm. authoritatively stipulated room for debate about cruelty, mm -hmm. not just in the legislatures that ordain the punishments, but in the courts that consider what has been ordained. Right. And it's more important for us to make room for that debate than to settle it or close it down. Okay. Uh, yeah, just sure. I, I just think it is also we're saying that Everybody agrees that adjudication involves uh, evaluation. At the very minimum, the judge has to make a decision about whether he's going to be an anarchist or not, whether he's going to abide by the law or not. I mean, that's, that, that is a decision, a moral decision he has to make. So, uh, so it's really, uh, uh, there's just no plausible view that says that adjudication doesn't involve uh, evaluation at some point. So it's compatible with exclusive legal positivism. Professor, Professor Rez, did you have a point? Yeah. Um, Here's the microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, if I can make a comment on your suggestion here, Dennis, or your puzzle about interpretation. Um, following up on what Jeremy said and, and connecting it to what Michael said, the, the way I have suggested, which, as a, again, I have to emphasize, doesn't necessarily uh, come to the same end as a, same conclusion as Jeremy's suggestion, but we are very, very close on this. The way I've suggested uh, you read the uh, constitutional amendments, or the, the moral uh, terms in the constitutional amendments, um, is roughly as, as Jeremy described it. And it's, it's not really surprising. If you think of methods of legislative drafting, then you will tend to be more concrete and detailed in your drafting if you are dealing with a narrower range of phenomena and with a shorter time span, if you anticipate that, you know, once Intel brings out the next chip, you will need another regulation, then you can be fairly detailed and specific in drafting your regulation. The more wide-ranging phenomena you expect the, the statute of the regulation to apply to, and the longer you want it to survive in good shape, uh, the more abstract you will be in your language. And you might, in those cases, also do things which Jeremy described, I described as protecting rather than protecting discretion rather than closing discretion down. Mm. And the way it is done, I think, by uh, some of the constitutional amendments is by saying, the le Jeremy described it, I'm just repeating, it, it is the right thing to do for any upright person who, has, who is called upon to exercise a certain function to consider certain moral issues. The law may foreclose that. The law, in fact, the law's role is to foreclose that. The law's role is to provide some, let's call it, community judgment about how it should be done. 
not letting that person do it as best as he thinks it should be done, but telling him how to do it. Right. But then the super law, the constitution, may say we do not want the law to foreclose that. We do not want um, the legislature of the, this Congress or that Congress or in particular state in the Union to decide that certain things are all right even if they are torture. We want the judges to have the ultimate say on whether they are cruel and unusual punishment or torture or whatnot. And we are immunizing them from losing that say to Congress and so on. And that's what those things do. So the discretion is used by the judges as they would have done had there not been the amendment but they are protected by the amendment in doing so from being denied the opportunity to do, do so. And that connects with Michael's <coughs> observation on that matter, that to the extent that there is a putative intervention from the legislature to stop the courts from doing their function as protected by the right. Constitution, then the courts have a right to uh, declare that legislation inoperative ab initio or not ab initio as the case may be. Right. Now the, the, um, the abstract example uh, moves me to ask you this, this question. All right, so let me, let me just flip it from abstract to quite concrete. Take a case like Riggs versus Palmer where the statute seems to be completely dispositive, no discretion on one reading of the, of the, of the case, no discretion permitted and yet it seems to be controversial in precisely the ways that invite the claim Well, people are using, judges are using evaluative criteria to decide what the law is. And it's not, a, it's not an abstract case, in fact, it's a very concrete case. It doesn't get any more concrete than that. Um, would your, I mean, how, what would you say about that from the point of view of exclusive legal positivism and discretion? I'm, I'm not an ambassador for exclusive legal positivism, for reasons which I'm happy to explain. Uh, <laughs> but what I would say about this is that, first of all, it's a completely different issue. The courts do a, a range of things, and some of them you could say, so, so as, as a preamble to that, what the Constitution or any legal text says is, in my view, a matter of legal practice. It is, it's not a matter of the uh, dictionary meaning, if you like, of, of the text. Right. It's a way of what the rules as set up by that text is understood and applied in, in, within the context of the legal system, and that may change from time to time. Now, some of the things that the courts do and get away with, they have no right to do. They know legal rights. It may be morally upright. It may be absolutely their moral duty to do what they do. But sometimes they do things which they have no right to do. Um, my favorite example of this in the British context used to be the Annis Winnick decision, which was a complete judicial disregard for a limitation of jurisdiction, uh, review jurisdiction by statute, which is just flagrant breach of law. Uh, just the, uh, no doubt, the heroic uh, fight between the common law and, and the legislature <laughs> living on uh, in these uh, much diminished times. Uh, but they got away with it, right? And uh, they have, there was no reaction from the legislature. So wh whether what they do was actually within their legal rights or not is a matter of interpreting the law of the particular jurisdiction concerns, and it's not to be taken for granted that just because they do it and get away with it, they had a legal right to do it. Right. But wouldn't, um, wouldn't a certain, um, a certain uh, person contiguous to Jeremy take the view that, not, not contiguous today, um, take the view that you're begging the question because the question of what the law is has to be settled before we can answer the question whether the judge has gone beyond the law in the way you just so eloquently described. 
I would describe, I'm, I'm more charitable to myself as you might expect. I would, <laughs> I would describe what I've said, not as begging the question, but as leaving it open. <laughs> until, until you settle Touché. what the law is, you cannot answer the question that you ask. Right. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, you've been very patient. Good. We move the mic. Yes. Okay. Just about anything's hard to find, right? What I was, oh, what I was going to ask you is, are you familiar with the uh, eight United States Marines at Camp Pendleton in New York, in uh, California, who had been in chains? who have been in solitary confinement, they were treating worse than any of our prisoners, I'm sure. <laughs> Chains, our Marines, our own Marines who are living, uh, offering their lives in, in uh, the wars, and, and here they're in chains, and they're in solitary confinement in California. And one of the fathers were on, was on television, and they uh, had to sell their house and everything to, to try to, to uh, have legal advice for their son. And, and uh, the reason they're there, isn't it innocent till you're proven guilty? I thought that was our law, innocent till proven guilty. Uh, and then the enemy, our enemies, have accused these Marines of killing somebody, uh, which wasn't, well, it's up for grabs to find out. They were only doing their job. They're offering their lives. So I wondered if you're familiar with the Pendleton 8 United States Marines in California in solitary confinement and chains. Thank you, ma'am. I'm familiar. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't have an opinion on it that would be um, informed, so I think I'll, I'll take, the, uh, take the high road and say um, it's one of several deeply controversial aspects of our current situation, and um, I wish them the best, and I do hope that uh, we can resolve this at some point in the not too distant future so that uh, the problems uh, that the families are experiencing that you've so eloquently described can come to an end. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, back here, could we move the microphone to the next to the back row? Next to the last row? Thank you, Chair. Uh, in the back there, yes. You guys can. Either one of them. <laughs> Whoever wants Which to. Which one? Tick tock, tick tock. Thank you. Um, I wonder how much of this debate, in some ways, simply is a matter of perspective. Um, and the capacity of those perspectives to describe the phenomenon. And the phenomenon, I'd say, is in, entails a collective intentionality. To be able to deal with law, you have to say, in certain texts, blah, 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 count as law. And then we can do two things. We can make statements of law, it's an internal perspective, or we can make statements about law. You know, that is in some ways parasitic on that internal perspective. That counts at law in that society. But as Hart said in his postscript, we can have two theories of law, you know, both fine. You know, one from the, that is, uh, takes the internal perspective all the way through and makes normative claims about it and comes up with statements of law. But as Hart says, we can always step back from that and simply describe what's going on within that society. So does there really need to be a, a debate if uh, they both maintain the phenomenon of law? Let me just make one other outsider perspective. It seems to me that where you lose the phenomenon of the law is by taking a further Quinean reduction. And then, I mean, to the point where we could have a theory of law that talked about the molecular properties and chemistry of the judges that eventually results in these things on these words that in the society they count as, as law. At that point, you've lost the phenomenon. But it seems to me that you can have two very good theories that si simply make, seem to seek two different kinds of propositions of or about. OK, well, let me, um, let me answer that by, just by giving you an answer from the point of view of uh, Dworkin's book, Law's Empire. 
Um, the book is, the book is uh, an account of uh, what it means to say that a proposition of law is true. And, the, and one of the fundamental debates in legal theory is a meta-debate. It's a debate about what the proper criteria are for deciding that a proposition of law is true. And then law's empire is a sustained answer to that question. It requires a theory of the practice, and uh, it involves uh, certain claims about what, the, what uh, is phenomenologically the case as a matter of the practice and what has to be the case as a, as a matter of um, ethical and conceptual necessity, just to, just to put it very broadly. But the debate, it's not just, it's not just a, yes, it's a question of perspective, but, but all debates are questions of perspective. The question is, what is the debate about? And the debate is about what the proper criteria are for deciding that propositions of law are true. Economists will tell you that propositions of law are true if and only if they are consistent with a certain measure of efficiency. All right? um, and, and this competes with Dworkinian interpretivism and uh, a variety of positivist accounts. But it's all, these are all directed to the question of, I mean, I think Dworkin gets this absolutely right in the opening 55 pages of, of Law's Empire. He says this is the most important, this is what the book is about, and I think he's, he's right, that's the most important question. So that's what, that's what the debate's about, is, is the, it, it's, a, it's a meta debate, to put it that way, about um, what it means to say that a proposition of law is true. That's this. Right. So um, Hart is Hart is in the in the postscript. Hart is disputing whether or not the meta debate that Dworkin claims is essential has to occur. Right. So um, just because Hart says Hart says in, in effect we're doing two different things. That's his claim. Now um, whether or not that's that's true or not is is of course a subject of great uh, debate itself. And I don't think that I don't think just because he says that makes it makes it so. Well, let me just I don't care if I said this and uh, actually, but I, I do think that the the, the uh, that the positivist theory external perspective is in a sense parasitic. It has to engage that, but why can't it go ahead and be parasitic and then stop out and describe what it's observed? It seems still to maintain the phenomenon, it just doesn't endorse it. Right. Well, it I mean, describes, is... I mean, I guess my one way of putting this is describability. It still can describe the phenomenon. It can right. be described from inside, it can be described from outside. And we don't lose it until we drop down to a second level, you know, more scientific explanation of the molecular events. Right. Um, well, that, the problem is, just, just from the, from the Dworkinian point of view, the problem is, is that that's not responsive to what Dworkin argues is the central question of, of a theory of law, which is what justifies the state in coercing people to do, to do things against their will, pay damages, go to jail, and the like. He says that's the central question. And Hart, is say, and Hart of course, uh, is, is saying law has no purpose as such. So he's disputing this question. So this, this, is, this is the at least the initial point of contact uh, for the debate. And so um, what you've described is a, is, a, is a portion of Hart's position, but it do, I don't think it goes any way to um, providing a decisive answer to, uh, to Dworkin. Um, yeah, I, I, you seem to be associating the exclusive legal positivist view with the external perspective, and that doesn't seem to me to be true. No, I, didn't, that's, I didn't mean to say that. That's not, uh, I didn't, I didn't really mean to say that. I was oh. making an argument about describability. Right. And from, which I get is common ground with the exclusive legal positive, but that it's the capacity of draw upon, drawing upon simply um, empirically understandable sources for describing the law. But it does, it does seem to be possible to take the internal perspective on the law, whatever that means, because that's a, a loaded confusing term, but take the internal perspective and nevertheless come to the conclusion that the law is source-based. It does seem to me those two things are compatible with one another. And it, it is worth uh, mentioning that the internal perspective, I, I honestly don't, usually I don't understand what people are talking about when they say the internal perspective. Does it mean that you think that you're morally 
uh, that the law, there's a prima facie moral duty to obey the law. Hart didn't think that. He didn't think that there was a relationship between taking the internal perspective and thinking that the law was morally justified. So I, I honestly don't know what it means to take the internal perspective. But even setting that aside, assuming that it means something, it doesn't necessarily preclude uh, an exclusive legal positivist approach, it seems to me. So, um, Professor Patterson, you sort of issued this challenge to Raz to sort of talk about sort of what kind of concept you thought the concept of I law was. I regard it as a polite request. But. Um, yes. Um, and I, I, I don't know what Professor Raz's um, views about this are. It, it didn't seem like, it seemed like the, the alternatives that you gave, the sort of artifact alternative and the natural kind alternative, were sort of too impoverished. And another sort of natural alternative uh, seemed like something that was, could be made compatible with his view. So if you think of uh, functional kinds, for instance, where the paradigmatic example is a Coke machine, where a Coke machine is, is just some system that reliably takes inputs of pocket change and outputs Cokes. Um, and you might think that, like, look, maybe there's some other constraints on what it is to be a Coke machine. But anything that does that, anything that realizes that structure uh, is a Coke machine. And then if you want to look at a particular Coke machine and, and find out what all the facts about it are, you just look at that Coke machine and you use, you know, ordinary non-normative interpretation of that Coke machine, you're like, oh, it's got the little wheels here and the gears and levers there, right? And the thought is like, look, the law could be an institution of a particular kind that uses particular kinds of coercive methods, right, which takes people's ordinary dispositions and outputs a situation in which people's dispositions are more sensitive to the reasons that antecedently apply to them, right? And then again, Whatever, whatever the gears are in that system are just whatever the gears you find out when you take your magnifying glass and you look at the system. Um, and it would be not the kind of thing you, that seems entirely compatible with positivistic mode of interpretation if you had that notion of the kind of concept that the law was. Um, well, I'm not, this, this wouldn't be the, the first time um, one of my explanations was characterized as impoverished, but um, be that as it may, uh, I was offering what is a conventional dichotomy, um, just, just taken from the, the philosophy liter literature, natural kinds and artifactual kinds. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this, is, this is Putnam. This is just classic straight stuff. Can you have functional kinds? Absolutely. What, I, what I'm looking for, what I'm hoping for, is to, um, to draw out of Joseph. I want to hear more. I like exclusive legal positivism. I find it an attractive. Uh, position. I have some problems with it, and I'd like to know more about Joseph's views on this question of uh, necessity, because this is now, um, I mean, it's a, the field, the field of analytic jurisprudence has now become, I, in, my, in my humble opinion, has, has now uh, become a, a, a space where People are talking more and more about hardcore metaphysical issues and things like necessity, quiny, and naturalism, which weren't even on the horizon, I think, 15 years ago, are now all the rage and widely discussed. And I'd like to um, nudge Joseph into talking a bit more about necessity as a way of getting him to comment on some aspects of, of this debate. I actually, I mean, I have no brief for Quinianism, no brief for interpretivism. My, my view is, hasn't really been articulated, but I think that, I think that um, when you look at what some of the leading people are doing in the field, um, this is at least in part where a lot of the discussion is and where I think it will continue to be. And so um, in, in uh, employing the distinction between natural kinds and artifactual kinds, I was simply using a conventional, well-regarded distinction and asking the question, okay, where does this account of necessity figure vis-a-vis -vis that? If um, Joseph were to advance a functional explanation, I'd be shocked, but I'd welcome it. One, one more question, yes. I was socialized as a law student in a civil law country, the Netherlands. Um, and um, I think the civil law tradition there had been strongly influenced by one book, um, which every law student at my time had to read, uh, Paul Scholten's Algemeen Deel. 
um, which was some kind of Dworkin without the right answer thesis, uh, saying uh, you have to be an interpretivist, but there is finally a jump in the conscience of the judge making the right statement. And having that kind of socialization, I have always been a little bit um, ill at home in the debate in the Anglo-Saxon world because somehow it didn't fit into my culture. And it would radicalize this point. Uh, you made the point um, law is contingent, but within our concept of law, it may be possible to have necessary truth or necessarily uh, analytical uh, statements. Let's take the example that we are in a legal system where everyone has been trained, socialized by Dworkin and his followers. So we, everyone is an interpretivist in this way. Uh, would that make in such a legal system, our legal system, let's say I'm in that system, it a necessary truth what Dworkin claims? Well, a legal system where everyone was trained by Ronald Dworkin and like-minded people would guarantee full employment for lawyers <laughs> because argument of a qualitative order, I might add, uh, would, be, would, would certainly be the order of the day, right? Because everything would be, would be argued because for Dworkin, justification goes all the way down. So everything from a parking ticket to the Eighth Amendment question would receive um, the same level of, uh, of intense argument. Um, now, in terms of, of, of necessity, I, I don't know. I, um, I, I've, Dworkin has um, recently um, flirted with natural kinds, and I've um, published a piece smacking his hands for doing that because I didn't think he really knew what he was talking about, and I thought it undermined a significant uh, element of his, of his theory. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, the academic legal culture is Ronald Dworkin because the distinction between fit and justification permeates everything. You can't talk about any subject without that dichotomy being either in the foreground or the background. So for good or ill, his view of the world is in some ways already consistent, is, is already been embraced in the way that your fantasy nightmare to others, uh, describes. Fit and justification rules the world, and no sophisticated uh, account of law can, I think, ignore it. I know, you have explained, a, a Dutch person told me that they love uh, to work in, in the Netherlands, so now you've explained uh, why that's the case. I mean, I, I would say one thing, we're not, we're not beholden to the concept of a law in another legal culture when describing their law, I mean, we could still say uh, that applying our concept of law, that they, certain things that the Dutch call the law aren't law, and other things are. But, but, but there is a, I mean, there's a part of the question which is not like, how much do we admire the law, but um, <laughs> how much is an institution constituted? by the self-understanding that is uh, put about in my own I've got, I've got to say, I, I am uncomfortable with the example because it does suggest something that I, I, I said, and I, and I believe uh, Professor Raza said, that it's, there's no necessary connection between the law and the concept of law. You can have law without any concept of law, certainly without knowing you have the concept of law, but even without the concept of law. Um, and well, so, you, you, or with the wrong concept. Exactly, that would be with the wrong concept. I, I think you can have it, but I'm posing the reverse. We all have this concept of law. What does it mean then for our self-understanding of law, and what does it mean for the concept of law in a culture like that? And I think if you really f take that fantasy, well, uh, I'm surprised about it that you think it's really the standard here, because I always have as an outsider the idea that walking is not so popular uh, in Anglo-Saxon world uh, as you suggest. Um, but if we take this fantasy seriously, then I think we really have to accept this contingent uh, confirmation of Dworkin's concept of law uh, in a way which falsifies at least any attempt for what kind of positivism to have a general concept of law which is universal. But Dennis's position would be that the law as a system and as a practice 
could survive the, the, the permeation of a false theoretical accounting system, right? Or at least doesn't depend on there being a right theoretical accounting system. I want to say yes, but I wonder what comes next. So, no, 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 yes. no I, think, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. I, also, it's, it is worth drawing a distinction between uh, the concept of law within a legal system and the rule of recognition. The reason why I'm, uh, I, I feel like it's got to be relevant that everybody in the Dutch legal system, in this mythical Dutch legal system, has the co Dworkin's concept of law is I'm starting to think, well, they must have a, rule of, a certain rule of recognition. And using my concept of law, let's say I'm a Hardian, that's relevant to what the law is. So I'm not, uh, I'm confused about how to dissociate those, uh, those two things. It's obviously relevant to some extent, but not, there may not be a perfect mapping of the Dutch concept of law with what is Dutch law, according to our concept of law. Let's give uh, Professor Raz the last word on this. Just uh, uh, in, in one sentence, it has been a long and uh, honorable tradition in legal philosophy, at least from Bentham, if not from the sophist, uh, to the legal realist, and not least to Dworkin, to debunk the self-understanding of legal practitioners. It was a major aim of all those writers to say, to lawyers and to judges, you don't understand what you are doing properly, we will tell you. Right. Great. Uh, well, okay. Uh, uh, first, uh, before, before we break, uh, join me in thanking Dennis Patterson and Michael Green for a terrific discussion. Thank you both. <laughs>